Ruth chapter 3. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. And Lord, we thank you for an opportunity to just be able to come and learn as we continue to go through uh, just the pages of your love letter. And so bless this time that we have. We lift it up to you and we ask that you would uh, just speak to us, Lord. And may we be open to hear from you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So Ruth chapter 3. Uh, in Ruth chapter 1, we saw Elimelech, husband of Naomi, um, in the house of bread, Bethlehem, right, of Judah, um, a famine in the land, and he decides to go out of the house of bread to seek bread. And so the famine should have alerted him. The outside circumstances of his life should have alerted him to look to the Lord. And so that's what we're called to do when things are kind of like, whoa, what's going on? What's happening? something is getting my attention. Well, let's look up because that's where our help comes from, right? That's where we can get what we need. And so if there's something that's lacking in our life, that's what it should have done. But what did they do? They took matters into their own hands, trying to control the situation maybe, and they left the provision of God, the house of bread to get sustenance. Doesn't make sense. But there they go. And so they go off with their two sons. And if you remember, their two sons um, one was like sick and the other one was called tired and something like that, right? That's, that's kind, of, kind of what their names uh, meant, right? So sick and tired go uh, with, you know, Ruth, who means pleasant, and Elimelech, uh, I don't remember, but God is king or something. But he's not living like God is king. And so they go to Moab, a foreign land, to seek that which is um, hopefully in the will of God, but they did it outside the will of God. And Elimelech ends up dying. And so they would be there another 10 years, sick and tired, find a wife. One was uh, Orpah and the other one would be Ruth. And there they are in the land. And then the two sons die. And Naomi finds herself in a struggle where she's widow and she has no kids and she's hurting. And she hears that back in Bethlehem, there's bread again, that God has given them favor and there's sustenance. And so she decides, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and leave. I'm going to go back to where I belong. I'm going to go back to my homeland. But she encourages the two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, why don't you guys just go ahead and stay in your homeland and find yourselves a husband here. Find security and rest in your land, but I'm going to go back. Both of them say, no, we want to go with you. She encourages them and says, you know, I'm, I'm old. I'm tired. And I've gotten to the place in life where even if I found a husband, and got pregnant, are you guys going to wait for that child, that son to grow up and marry him? I have no kids left in me. And so why don't you guys just go home? Orpa says, I'm going to go back to my homeland. I'm, I'm in my homeland, but I'm going to go back to my family and I'll try to make life uh, work there. But Ruth wouldn't have it. She saw something in Naomi where she was attracted and ultimately, she makes Naomi's God her God. The true and living God, the God of Israel, becomes Ruth's God. And she says, you know what? Wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And I'm just going to stick with you. And so she ends up going back. They come into the city. The um, women greet them as they enter in. And they say, Naomi is back. Pleasant is returned. And what does Naomi say? Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter, for life has dealt, God has dealt treacherously with me. So she's out of her mouth saying one thing, but her actions are showing another thing. She's walking by faith by going back to where she belongs, but it's hard. She has had a hard life, has she not? Lost her husband in the first year. Ten years later, she loses both of her sons. And so, you know, who can blame her, if you will, in that setting? Um, and so that's chapter one. We end there. Uh, in chapter two, um, this is all introduction for chapter three. But in chapter two, we see Ruth is not content to sit and wait for God to drop, you know, food in their lap. And what does she do? She says, hey, I know that you guys have this law where I can go out to the fields and I can glean. It's written in your law. How about I do that? And uh, Ruth or Naomi tells her, you know, go ahead and do that, my daughter. And so she goes out and she happens upon Boaz's field. And he's the man that was wealthy, that God had prospered in that time. And he just so happens to be their kinsman redeemer, the individual that can actually 
get them back to where they needed to be through just the laws that God has placed within the Bible. And so you see that taking place and you see um, the character of Boaz and you see the character of Ruth. And I saw uh, Boaz as kind of like a seasoned Christian, somebody who has been walking with the Lord and has been faithful. And then I see uh, Ruth as like a baby Christian, um, not always maybe doing everything perfectly, but definitely trusting in God and definitely desiring to move in the direction of God. And so she works the entire harvest season uh, in Boaz's field. And they have a little encounter, a little, I don't know, a little love connection or something going on there that I kind of picked up on. And um, it comes at the point where Boaz, you know, inquires, hey, who, who's this in the field? A little, a little honey over there, you know. And they say, well, that's Ruth. She's the one that came back with Naomi, her mother-in-law. And they give the story and her, her um, character precedes her. She's doing things that are right. She's uh, looking to the Lord. She's made, uh, you know, Naomi's God, her God. And she's a hard worker. She's diligent to do. At the end of the chapter, something that struck me as I was reading it was Boaz had encouraged Ruth to hang out with the maidens who were working in the field. She goes back and she recounts the story to, uh, to Naomi. And she tells her, yeah, so he said that I can hang out with the guys in the field. And then Naomi corrects her and says, uh, no, you need to hang out with the women in the field. And so I see maturity on both Boaz and Naomi's part to be able to pour into a younger, uh, new believer, if you will, to set her straight and help her out with that. And all of us are called to that, right? As Christians, we need to look for the younger to be able to pour truth into them and to gently you know, nudge them in the right direction. And so hopefully we want to hold people accountable, but more importantly, hopefully we want to be held accountable. And that's something that is unattractive to the world today. Everybody wants to be their island. They want to be their own rock. They don't want people telling them what to do. They don't want tell people telling them how to do it. And so for us as Christians, hopefully we're open to receive truth from people that God puts in our lives to be able to speak that truth. And sometimes it's uncomfortable, right? I know that. I've been there. Sometimes it's awkward. Like, awkward, you know, they're telling me that I got this weakness or they're pointing out this thing in my life. But guys, how else are we going to grow? How else are we going to be able to try to move forward in the direction that the Lord wants to uh, grow us in? So be open to be able to receive truth from people. And it really is secondary, the source of it. It just matters that you are open to receive from people that are speaking truth so that you can grow, grow better, that you can grow more mature in God and in the things of God. Um, and what I try to do is I try to evaluate, especially if it comes from a source that I'm like, sucker, what are you trying to tell me? You ain't even got your life together. You know, one of those people. What I try to do is I just try to say, okay, Lord, how much of a percentage do I own of this? Like, you know, is this like just out of left field and <laughs> this don't have nothing to do with me, you know, kind of thing? Or do I own some of this? 10%, 15%, 50%, 100%. And then I try to, you know, take that, whatever I own, and say, Lord, okay, I can see how that's true. So anyways, I saw that taking place toward the end of the chapter. Then we move on to um, chapter 3. I do want to read you the last verse um, in chapter 2 because it shows just this diligence of Ruth to be able to work hard. In Ruth chapter 2, the last verse 23, it says, So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz, she got the message, to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. And so that shows Ruth was willing to work, she stuck with it over the long haul, but also she took the message. She stayed with the women. I think that's neat. All right, so verse 1, chapter 3, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? And so the time of harvest was over, and certainly Ruth and Boaz had been around each other. Um, much in the weeks covering the barley harvest, and we saw that she was willing to work. And I think this is important for 
Somebody that the Lord wants to bring into our life, if you will, in a relationship that we're going to move forward in. I think our American way of dating is no bueno, no good. I think what dating in America does for us is it generally sets us up for a desire to separate and be divorced. What happens? We meet somebody, maybe there's an initial attraction, something happens, we get together, and over a period of time, something happens where it's like, mm, yeah, I'm done with this, we move on. And that happens through cycle after cycle, person after person, and before you know it, all we're doing is meeting somebody, hooking up, breaking up. Meeting somebody, hooking up, breaking up. Meeting somebody, hooking up, breaking up. If you look at what's taking place here, that's not at all what's happening. They're meeting on a neutral ground. They're not putting their best foot forward in a fake dating relationship where, okay, I'll open the car door for you now, but you do we get married? Uh, you're going to be opening the door for me, you know? And, and it's just, it's this contrived thing where everyone's on their best behavior and making sure that they're doing all the right things. They're meeting each other on neutral ground where their true character is able to be revealed, where they're able to see one another for who they really are. And in that, their character is being proven. And, and the truth of the matter is, none of us are perfect, right? All of us have flaws, but they're seeing, wow, Boaz, look at how he treats his workers. He greets them with the Lord's greeting. They greet him back with a God, a blessing from God. There's a neat little dynamic there. There's a neat little relationship that's taken. There's respect on both parts. And so you're able to see the character. Ruth, she's not willing to just sit at home and wait for God to show up in her life. She's going to step out in faith and say, hey, you guys have this law where I can go glean. And she doesn't do it once. She doesn't do it all day one day. She does it for the whole season. In that time, there's an opportunity for them to see one another, to see the character of one another come out. And I think that's a better approach than, unfortunately, our approach. But this is kind of how we do it. I will say this. In premarital counseling, anytime that I... I do premarital counseling. I try to encourage the couples that they want to be together long enough um, prior to getting married to see one another over the seasons of life. And what I mean by that is in, you know, in our regular January through December, we go through seasons, right? We start with winter, we go uh, spring, then we have summer, fall right? As you go through the seasons. And so we, as people, we go through seasons as well. And we want to see people when it's good, when it's spring and everything's new and blossoming and, whoa, look at the pretty flowers. And hold on, are those birds singing? That is so pretty. And that's good times, right? That's just great. Everything's new and fresh and it just rained and, and it, the, the ground's clean and just life is good. But and then you come to summer and eventually you'll get to winter. And sometimes in winter it could be mild, but sometimes in winter it'd be tough. But you want to see people over those seasons to see, man, is this a keeper? Is this a person that's going to look to the Lord? Are they going to run to the bottle? Are they going to run to the drugs? Are they going to run to whatever substance that's going to numb them for a season because they can't deal with the hard things in life? And so that's what I encourage people. And so I kind of try to adopt our, or adapt our Western way of dating. I'm not going to change that, right? But at least try to incorporate some godly, biblical uh, kind of perspectives and things that you're looking for in that process. So we see that taking place here. We see Ruth able to be able to see Boaz in over a season of time and to be able to see his character truly come out. And we see the same thing with Boaz. He's able to see Ruth in that same thing. So over the period of the harvest, Ruth and Boaz got to know each other pretty well by seeing what kind of people the other was around a larger group, not by dating in the way it is traditionally thought of. The Hebrew word for security there in verse 1 is the same word for rest in Ruth 1.9, where Naomi hoped that her daughter-in-laws would find rest and security in the house of a new husband. This Hebrew word pronounced manoach, uh, it's M-A-A-H, I'll spell it to you, M 
M-A-N-O-W-A-C-H. Manawach, because it's Hebrew, speaks of what a home should be, a place of rest and security. As I was going through this study this week, I was just thinking, it doesn't matter where we're at right now. It just matters this is where we're at right now. And when we hear of what things should be, are we willing to move in that direction? So let's say my house is not a house of rest and security. Am I desiring to make it a place of rest and security? Because that's God's heart. And that's what that word, again, means. In Ruth 1.9, she used it. Why don't you guys go find the security out there in Moab? And here, it's again repeated in verse 1. And she uses the same word, but translates it security. And so I think there's something to be said about that. Verse 2. Now Boaz, whose young women, you were... Is that right? Yeah. Now Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. And so Naomi is letting Ruth know that she can go to this kinsman, this kinsman redeemer is the word, but um, she's making a suggestion that Ruth was rooted in a peculiar custom in ancient Israel, the meaning behind the word goel. And so that's the word she uses for a relative. This was the point in Naomi's question about Boaz. Is he not our relative? She, mind, she reminded Ruth that Boaz was the family Goel. And so that's what's taking place. Now, throughout the scriptures, um, there's different things that that Goel, that, that nearest kinsman redeemer, had a responsibility of. Let me share some with you. In Leviticus chapter 25, verse 48, the kinsman redeemer was responsible to buy a fellow Israelite out of slavery. In Numbers 35, 19, he was responsible to be the avenger of blood to make sure the murder of a family member answered uh, to the crime. In Leviticus 25, 25, he was responsible to buy back family land uh, that had been forfeited. And in Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 10, the, the scriptures we read in our time of responsive reading, he was responsible, responsible to carry on the family name by marrying a childless widow. And so when she says, is he not our relative? Since Boaz was rec the recognized Goel for the family of Elimelech, the deceased husband of Naomi and father-in-law of Ruth, Ruth could appeal to him to safeguard the posterity of Elimelech's family and take her in marriage. It may seem forward to us, but it was regarded as proper in that day. And so they have the scriptures as their guide. I think life is difficult. I think life can get crazy. But I think life without the compass of God's word leads to just like, man, we don't even know which way to turn, which way to go, which way to run, which way to look. But as you look to the word of God, it reads true north. If you had a compass and you were trying to figure out, okay, I need to go north. Boom. Okay, north is straight up. Let's go north. It, it, it's the guide, right? Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. And so we need to study the scriptures. We need to be in the word. And we see that taking place here again, that she's not asking her to do something that is um, inappropriate. She's saying, hey, the word gives for this uh, thing that you can do. Moving on, verses three through five. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go in, uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. Now, as I'm reading this... <laughs> And I don't have any commentary, and I didn't live in, you know, 1000 BC. And I'm looking at this, I'm like, what the heck is she telling her to do? 
All right, he's going to be at the threshing floor, and, you know, the harvest is done. So now what they're doing is they're threshing the wheat, and so go to the harvest, and he's going to be sleeping by his pile of grains, right? And so as he's sleeping, why don't you go and, well, here, here, do this. Uh, uncover his feet and kind of lay right there by his feet, and uh, then uh, it's going to be good. But first, make sure you wash up and put some perfume on. <laughs> what? I'm like, whoa, what is this? And so, of course, this all has significance. And from our perspective, we're looking at it one way, and it has nothing to do, do with that. Uncover his feet and lie down. At the appropriate time, Naomi instructs Ruth to go in, uncover his feet, and lie down. Some might think this was a provocative gesture, as if Ruth was told to provocatively offer herself sexually to Boaz. This was not how this gesture was understood in that day. In the culture of that day, this was understood as an act of total submission. In that day, this was understood to be the role of a servant to lay at their master's feet and be ready for any command of the master. So when Naomi told Ruth to lie down at Boaz's feet, she told her to come in in, total humble, submiss in a totally humble, submissive way. And so if you think about that, the slave would go in and he would do this, letting his master know, I'm in total submission to you. Whatever you need, whatever you desire, I'm here for that. All you have to do is say it. Now if you think about it, scripturally, she had a right in the kinsman redeemer, right? She could have usurped that and said, hey, sucker, you're next in line. Marry me, give me some babies, and let's get this on the road, right? No, <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't do it like that. And Naomi at her counsel is telling her that's not how you go about this. And so there is something of a, a romantic little thing that is taking place. You remember in chapter two, Boaz, Boaz had inquired, hey, who is this gleaning in our field? He, he noticed when he comes and he greets the servants and he says, who is it? And that's when I had told you that Ruth's reputation had preceded her because he is told by the servants, this is Ruth, the daughter-in-law of Naomi, who came from Moab, who had lost her husband. They were there 10 years in Moab lost her husband and she's come back. She's made the God of Naomi her own God. The God of Israel is now her God and she has incredible character. So he had heard that. He watched her and then he invited her to a meal. And you'll remember in chapter 2 he told her, you know, when I dip in whatever it was that they were dipping, a little dipping sauce there or whatever, he goes, you feel free to dip from my dish. And that is kind of where it started, their relationship, or at least um, the awareness that, hey, I'm watching you and I know you're watching me, okay? And so now they get to see each other over the whole of the harvest time, and Naomi is counseling Ruth, who doesn't know all of the rules, all of the laws, all of how this takes place, but there's a romantic thing that's taking place, but there's also a very practical law abiding, I'm honoring God through this process thing that's taking place. And I think the two coupled is just a neat little story of, you know, how stuff like this can take place. Um, I had two notes that, that I found interesting that I, that I copied down. Uh, in a marriage relationship, many husbands wish they had a wife who submitted to them the way Ruth is being told here but do they provide the kind of godly leadership, care, and concern that Boaz showed towards Ruth and others? On the other hand, in the marriage relationship, many wives wish they had a husband who loved, cared, and treated them uh, the way Boaz did towards Ruth. But do they show the same kind of humble submission and respect Ruth showed to Boaz? I was listening to some messages, and I heard of Chuck Missler who at the time he was outside of God's will. And what he was doing was he was overworked. He was neglecting his wife and he was neglecting the kids because he was addicted to work and everything that that entailed. I don't know if you know anything about Chuck Missler, but he would buy up businesses that were failing and get them on board and then sell them. And he's just making money hand over fist and he was addicted to it. He was doing very well in that uh, industry. And so he comes home one night, 
uh, after work or whatever, and he notices something's different. And he has the best plate and the best silverware. You know, you ever get those forks that have like oh, one of the things all off and <laughs> kind of poke yourself as you're trying to eat or what? No, his wasn't that. It was it was the one good fork in the cabinet, you know. And he had just everything nice, and it was like the best of the best. And he looked at it and he's like, whoa. Treating me pretty right here. What's going on? And so he doesn't think about it. Just kind of eats and everything. And it happens three times in, his, in a row. His wife just sets him up and makes sure that he's the first one to get the meal. Make sure that he has the best silverware. Make sure that everything is right on the plate. Cooked to perfection. And he's like, hold up. Time out. Wait. What's up? What's going on here? And she says, you know, I've been reading the word. I've been in the word and um, I'm clear, God is clear what my responsibility and obligation is. I'm to submit to you, I'm to come under you, and I'm to treat you in a certain way as unto the Lord. And you are God's responsibility. I don't have to change you. I don't have to fix you. That's between you and God. So from this point in our marriage, I'm just going to be faithful to God and I'm going to let God take care of you. He said from that day on, done. He changed and he said, man, if this, it scared him into honoring his wife and taking care of the children and making sure that he's spending time with them, the thing that he was neglecting. And from that time on, he said he no longer made work his idol. And I just thought, man, that is so awesome that an individual can look to the Lord, look to the scriptures, get from God what they need to do. As much as we want to change somebody, guys, we can't even change ourselves. Are you aware of that? Are you aware that you cannot change yourself? It takes God to change you. We change our mind, God changes our heart. God will not change our heart until we change our mind. If we don't change our heart, our mind, God will let us go. And, and not let us go in the sense of, all right, sucker, you're going to hell. Nothing like that. But God will let us go to be left to that. If that's what we want, then God will say, all right, I'll, I give you incredible dignity to have a free will. But if you don't want me, I will not force myself upon you. I love you. I've demonstrated it on the cross. I've proved it to you in no uncertain terms. But if you want to experience change in a good way, in the right way, moving in the right direction, change your mind about how you're approaching life and what you're doing, and I will change your heart. And it's an incredible thing as you just experience that. And so all of this, as I'm witnessing and just watching this, this little thing transpire, it blows me away. Verse 6 and 7 so she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain and she came softly, uncovered his feet and lay down. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. There was a good reason why Boaz slept at the threshing floor. These were the days of the judges when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And the reason they did that was because people would wait until all that hard work of harvest, planting, watering, pulling weeds, that whole season of work and labor was done. And then you harvest, you take all of the goods, you, the grain, you take them to the threshing floor. Threshing floor is an interesting thing. It's kind of a barn, that looking thing. So imagine a barn open on both sides and some type of platform that's elevated so that when wind blows through both doors of the barn, you can take a pitchfork, take the wheat, if you will, and it hits the threshing floor and the, the what's it called? The, the chaff would be released from the wheat, the grain, and the wind would blow the chaff away. Did you know that that's how we grow in Christ? We go to the threshing floor and he takes us and we land on that threshing floor and the wind just takes away the chaff. Chaff is defined as useless outer shell. The useless outer shell in our life as we're just doing this thing. Remember, it's God who's on the hook 
for growing you up. It's God who's on the hook for the work in your life. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And so his name, his reputation is on the line for his kids. And I like that because it kind of like frees me up. But at the same time, remember there's that rubber band theology. Anybody remember that? John Corson talked about rubber band theology. So imagine you and God and there's this big rubber band. So, so here's you and then this big rubber band. And you can stretch, 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 stretch as far as you want. But the farther you go, oh, the harder you slam back. And yeah, that's that process too. And so that's rubber band theology. God is going to let us stretch so far before that rubber band and the tension on it is going to snap us back to the loving arms of God and our Savior to pick up the pieces of our broken heart and just sweep it into his little dustpan and then put it all back together. But be careful how far we stretch from the Lord because inevitable consequences and repercussions are going to come, right? And so just a beautiful thing that's taking place here. It's nothing that is, is, is bad, if you will. But that's why Boaz would sleep, if you will, uh, to guard his crop against the attacks of Israel. 1 Samuel 23, verse 1, gives us a picture of this happening, exact thing, that they would sleep right there in the threshing floor to protect the grain from people that would come and rob it. Okay? Verses 8 and 9. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet, and he said, Who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Now, again, picture the reason Boaz is sleeping on the threshing floor with the grain in that arena is because you know, looters would come, people would come, and he's over, he's the overseer, he's the one that's the, you know, uh, going to protect his crop and all of this, right? And, and chapter uh, 2 tells us that he was a wealthy man, and so he's the one that's taken responsibility for it. And in the uncovering of the feet, this act of submission on her part, um, I don't know if you know this, but he is displaced out of the feet. And so you can have the whole body covered. Chuck was sharing this story with me. He told me that his friend went to Antarctica and they did this study on um, heat and, and how the body is affected by heat because Antarctica is pretty cold. And so what they would do is they'd cover the whole body with tons and tons and tons of blankets and they would leave the feet uncovered and the person would be freezing cold. They would cover the feet and put a sheet on the person and would, it just felt good, like they were warm, just from the feet being covered. And so there's a you know, few little things playing, playing out here. Not only is it an act of submission, she's there at his feet, but at some point, he's going to be like, ooh, it's cold, what happened? And wake up and be startled. And so that's what happens. And in that moment, why is he there in that place to guard his crop? Now, I'm thinking, it doesn't say it, but when that happened and he woke up and saw that there's a person at his feet, he said, Mama Laguchi. Like, it doesn't say that right here. <laughs> but I think he said it, or something like that. I don't know. But something had to happen. Can you imagine? That's not Hebrew. Putting yourself, that's not Hebrew. Putting yourself in that situation where you're, you're on guard, you're watching your crops, and there's a person at your feet, and what the, you know, you plot a Oh, I almost stabbed you. Something. But nonetheless, that's what takes place. And then she says here, I'm, I'm just humbly asking, can you take the position of what God is requiring of you? In a humble way, can you just step up under your wing? Here she boldly asks Boaz to take her in marriage. The phrase can also be translated as spread the corner of your garment over me. This was a culturally relevant way to say, I am a widow, take me as your wife. In Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 8, God uses the same terminology in relation to Israel. I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you and you became mine, says the Lord. As Boaz here has this position and this responsibility, don't forget that the Bible says in the book of Psalms chapter 40 and in the book of Hebrews, 
Behold, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Everything in the scriptures is written about Jesus. And Boaz is a type of Jesus who is redeeming us, who bought us back out of the slave market. And just this beautiful little picture of what's taking place. Let's continue. 10 to the end. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether rich or whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if you will perform the duty of a close relative uh, for you, wait, wait. it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you. As the Lord lives, lie down until morning. So she lay down at his feet until morning, and she arose before one could recognize another, then he said, do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Also, he said, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, these six ephahs of barley he gave me for he said to me, do not go empty handed to your mother-in-law. Then she said, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter to this day. And so you see Boaz is even in an opportunity to be able to take advantage of a situation says, you know what? I want to do this God's way. I know, I have knowledge that there is a closer kinsman redeemer than me. And I have to give that individual the fair opportunity, the fair chance to be able to redeem you as much as I'd like to. I'm going to do the right thing, but I'm going to do it in the right way. And I think this is lost in our culture. I think the average person in our culture wants the greatest benefits for the least effort. I think they want to receive for themselves the most that they can get, but what are they willing to pay for? What are they willing to invest for? What are they willing to do for it? I see an incredible vulnerability on Boaz's part here to say, I'm going to trust God. I'm just going to trust God. God has proven to bless me. God has proven to be faithful to me. God has proven that his track record is excellent. And so as much as I want and desire to be with Ruth and to marry her and to take the responsibility and obedience to the word of God, I know that there's somebody who has to get the first chance. And we'll see that in chapter 4 next time we're in it and that whole thing transpire. That'll kind of close out the book. But to conclude... This is an amazing thing that I see on God's part. Remember Boaz as a type of God. God has made a decision to be vulnerable to you and me. Imagine that. Imagine that. The almighty, the all-powerful, the omniscient God has chosen to give you and I a free will to make choices, to be able to do with our life as we please, to be able to have our life move in whatever direction. And it's not, you know, it's not unlimited. I can't run the 40 dash in four, four seconds flat anymore. No, I probably never could. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's limitations. Honey, you can be anything you want to be. No, you can't. No, you can't. You know, some people aren't good at sports and they're not going to play professional. Some people can't dance. You're not going to win dancing with the stars. So cut it out. American Idol. You watch. You're going to be sorry. You can sing. Stop. No, no for me. It's a no for me, dog. Remember, Randy? So, but I think 
as I look at Boaz, I read the end of the chapter, I'm looking at what's transpiring here. He made himself extremely vulnerable. God does the very same thing to you and me. And here's my question. At what point is God worthy enough to you to be trusted? At what point in your life, at what point do you say, man, I mean, you know, I've known the Lord for about this long, and man, his track record is pretty perfect. Oh, he ain't never made a mistake. Let's, let's see. But yeah, there's this area in my life that I got to control. There's this area in my life that I got to be in charge of. There's this area in my life that I just continue need to manipulate things to make sure that it happens the way that I want to see it happen. At what point do we grow up and say, I'm going to switch the roles. I'm going to be vulnerable to God. I'm going to trust God to a degree that is like, man, people look at it and be like, dude, are you serious, man? You trust God like that? Yeah, yeah, you know what? It is scary. And, and, and it may cause vulnerability on my part in my life. But you know what? I think it's going to work out better because God's reputation is on the line and he's not going to ruin it on me. So I'm just going to trust him. And I'm going to be vulnerable to him so that he can be pleased with me. And that's out of a gratitude and a response for all that he's already done for me. It's not even like it's blind. It's not even like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. Gee, I wonder what's going to happen. It's going to go good. That's what's going to happen. And God will probably get rid of some stuff in your life and add some stuff to your life that's going to be better. But nonetheless, he calls us all to it. And all it is, when it's all said and done, because... I've been, I went through the whole book of Romans. I just finished it. Now I'm going through the book of Hebrews because I'm teaching Hebrews on Wednesday. And I'm just, this thing of the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, it just keeps coming up. The sovereignty of God, 100% true. God rules and reigns in the kingdom of men and he could do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. And yet, humanity has sovereignty as well. We have a free will. We can really pick and choose what we're going to do, when we're going to say what, how we're going to say it, all of that. So we're sovereign, and yet God is sovereign. But at what point do we switch roles and say, God, I've seen what happens when I try to force things, and it doesn't always end up really good. Even though I'm leery of control and giving up control, I'm going to give up control to the one who loves me, to the one who is for me and not against me, to the one who will let nothing separate me from his love, Romans chapter 8, those last verses, and all of that. And so that's my challenge to you as I end this chapter and I look at the vulnerability of Boaz and knowing that God makes himself vulnerable to us, I think, when do we switch the script and we just simply... Walk by what God is calling us to walk by, faith. Trust in him that he knows what he's doing and he has an incredible plan for our lives. But Lord, I just want to submit to that. I just want to roll with that. I want to let you run it, Lord. And if there's an area in my life that I'm vulnerable to or there's an area in my life that I'm trying to hold on to, Lord, help me to release it to you and let you lead me and guide me because I know that you love me and I know that your will for me is good acceptable and perfect according to Romans chapter 12 verse 2. His will is good it's acceptable and it's perfect. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father thank you so much for the scriptures Lord we thank you for your sovereignty Lord we thank you for your love for us we thank you Lord that you've proven that love to us on the cross if we ever doubt it we can look Lord that you gave your very best to secure a relationship with us and so, Lord, as we grow in our faith, I pray that we would trust you more and more. Lord, I pray that you would expose areas in our lives that we need to surrender to you. We need to let you have. And so thank you so much for just the word. Thank you for the examples that we have in the word. Thank you, Lord, that you call us to walk by faith and not by sight. And uh, just help us, Lord. Help us in the areas that we know you've been kind of maybe wanting to get our attention and shine a light on, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for the greatest love story ever told, 
the fact that you would go after us, that you would find us in the pit that you found us and that you would redeem us, that you would purchase us out of the slave market. And so thank you so much, Lord, for the death on the cross and what that means, life, abundant life in the here and now and definitely in the hereafter. So continue to have your way in our hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.